we're here today uh, for the most recent installment, the most current installment of our SAR CARES program. And when we started it a few weeks ago, we anticipated this was going to be a program speaking about um, the issues around coronavirus, around COVID-19, which at that point was the biggest and most immediately pressing issue confronting the country. And now we find ourselves just a few weeks later with two really big and immediate and pressing issues confronting the country because the coronavirus crisis hasn't gone anywhere. COVID-19 continues to be a problem. People continue to be getting sick. People continue to be dying. But at the same time, we now have the whole country convulsed with protests and demonstrations, which started after the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police in Minneapolis and have spread throughout the country, really starting from issues about racial disparities and how police treat African Americans and moving on to broader questions and broader issues of racial justice in American society. So Rabbi Hart Stark spoke to the whole school community about this last week when we came back from Shavuot and when circumstances seemed to have changed so much over Shavuot. We went from a situation in which there were protests in Minneapolis at the specific site uh, where George Floyd's killing happened to much broader nationwide protests really seemed to be turning into a movement. And so Rabbi Hart Stark addressed the whole school. We're back today to learn some more about it, to talk some more about it, and really importantly, as Rabbi Hart Stark said to us, to listen some more about it. And I wanna say a few words about that. We most often think about ourselves, we identify ourselves, we define ourselves as Jews, as Orthodox Jews. As our high school is a modern Orthodox co-educational community of learners. That's how we think about ourselves. And I think that for most of us, we don't think about ourselves in terms of any kind of racial identity, but most of us in this school community are white. Not all of us, but most of us in the school community are white. And that means that there might be certain experiences that we haven't had or certain things that we don't know because we haven't been exposed to them or they haven't been our reality or they haven't been something that we have to think about. And it is of course true that in our American history classes in 11th grade, and more broadly, when something like this happens in a current events kind of way that we address as part of the school community, this conversation does come up, it becomes something we speak about, it becomes something we speak to. But at the deep level of what we've experienced, of what we know in our bones, of what's our reality, of what's our history, of what we carry with us, for many of us, for most of us, the African-American experience is not that. It's not. It's not something that we, that we know deep in our bones, that we really study and think about all the time. And it's certainly not something for most of us that we carry with us as a lived experience. And so as a follow-up to what Rabbi Hartstark said and taught to the school community about the importance at this point of another aspect of our mission statement, of engaging the world with humility and openness, of hearing that things that we don't know or that aren't part of our experience are really important for us to hear and really important for us to learn. Today, we put together a program to have two speakers speaking to us, one more from the perspective of the history and background and the things that we have to learn and know in order to understand the current moment. And then the second, really talking to us from the pain and the weight of personal lived experience. And we think that both of those things are very important today. Both of those things are important for us to learn both of those things are important for us to understand and to know. So I want to tell you a little bit about the two speakers who are going to be addressing us today, and then we'll hear from the first speaker. You'll have a chance to submit questions to me in the chat if you, there are questions you'd like to address to her after she's done speaking, and then we will shift and hear from our second speaker. Again, moving from the goal of learning some of the history and background that frames the world that we're in today to um, moving on to hearing uh, about a personal experience. And so the first speaker that we are fortunate to have with us today is a woman named is Rachel Swarns. Rachel Swarns is both a reporter for the New York Times as well as a professor at NYU School of Journalism. And over the course of her career, she has written about race and race relations. Most famously, she was responsible for a deep exploration of the role of slavery in the roots of Georgetown University, which opened up a national conversation about American universities and their ties to slavery and led to conversations about the potential for those universities, those institutions to make restitution uh, for the harm that they might have been responsible for and that they, that they had been responsible for 
and that they had caused earlier in their history. Uh, she's also written a book about the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, using that one American person as a window into the complicated history and legacy of race in America. Ms. Swarns is also an academic advisor to the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC. And she now serves as a professor at NYU School of Journalism, so that she's teaching others how to, um, how to explore these issues, how to write about, and how to tell these issues. We actually first um, encountered her through the PPE class that Ms. Schneider, Rebecca Kroll, and I co-taught this year. She addressed that class in a very powerful and moving way and in a way that really shed light on the ways that history can help us understand the present moment. And so when we thought about somebody who would be a really powerful speaker to speak to us today, we wanted to invite her. The other speaker is coming from a very different perspective and a very different vantage point. And that is our own Mr. Bartholomew Atson, an SAR high school art teacher. And we asked him to speak because in addition to the history and the perspective that that brings to the conversation, we also wanted to have the personal lived experience and what that brings to the conversation. And again, for so many of us, that's not our own personal lived reality. And so it's important, as Rabbi Hartstark said, that we listen with humility and that we hear people whose lived reality that is telling us about it so that we can understand, or perhaps if we can't really fully understand, we can at least know what we aren't understanding, um, we can begin to hear the stories of people whose experience this is, because for most of us, it isn't our experience. And so today, in today's program, we both want a chance to look at the sweep of American history and the way it shapes the current moment that we're in, as well as the personal, individual, lived experiences and what that looks like for people for whom these kinds of encounters with law enforcement in American society in other ways can be their personal and painful realities. We are going to begin now by asking SAR High School art teacher, Mr. Bartholomew Atson, to share his own personal thoughts, experiences, and reflections for a few moments. Mr. Atson. Thank you for that, Dr. Schwartz. It's horrible in the world and depressing for everyone. Now I'm having trouble watching. You've all seen the images from the past two weeks death, unity, violence, and protests. We've watched our screens as black men and women are harassed and killed by our so-called authoritative figures. So many Americans are surprised by these events, but this is sadly very familiar to me. Uh, since I was a kid, my mother always told me to be careful, to be safe when I'm out in the world. She would always say that they were looking for boys like me so I need to survive. I never understood what she meant until I had my first interaction with the police officer at the age of 13. It was a cool late summer evening in Philly and my friends and I were coming from 7-Eleven, having fun doing what teenagers do. And as we were walking down the block, we were suddenly stopped. A cop car pulled over in front of us. I'm not sure if we were brave or if we were frozen with fear because none of us ran. If we did, it would have gotten worse. I still remember my hands on the warm steel of the police car and the cop invading my space, searching my legs and my body and going through my pockets. I'll never forget those flashing lights in my face and the embarrassment that I felt because we had not committed a crime. <clears throat> I was always tall but I was a kid. If you took the time to know me, you would see how fun and creative and free spirited I was. The only difference is that I was black. What hurt the most was when my cousin, who was like an uncle to me, saw my hands on the cop car. He asked me if everything was okay. All I could say is that I didn't do anything wrong. Luckily, the cops didn't hurt us and let us go. At that moment, I realized that I did everything that my mom told me. 
but I still could not avoid the police. Why? This was the question that I continued to ask myself throughout my adult years. After high school, I went to college at Marymount Manhattan uh, College in New York. And at this time in my life, I was muscular and tall, 6'3". Well, when I would go into the stores in certain areas, I would be followed around. I never understood why. I had the money to pay for it. When I told my friends about this who were not black, they wouldn't believe me. I've had an experience during my freshman year in college where four security guards at my college dorm stormed into my room in the middle of the night, threatening to arrest me, thinking that I pulled an alarm when I was sleeping. I took college very seriously. I just went to class and did my work. They accused me of something that I didn't do. So at that moment, everybody on the dorm floor when this was happening was scared. I called out to some of the dorm aides to help me out, but they were too afraid to even come out. Um, these security guards were huge. It was like four really big guys. And that was the first time I felt so alone and hurt because I thought I was in a safe place because I paid money to be there. Uh, and I got a scholarship. So I called my mom and I was in tears asking, what should I do? And she told me to calm down so I can handle the situation. It hurt to be blamed and it hurt because I was, you know, I, I was, I was, I was innocent. But that dramatic experience made me stronger because I got through it. Because I knew I was innocent. Experiences where I trains in Manhattan about the negative stares of police officers standing in front of the train doorway. I've been pulled over by cops for riding on the sidewalk. And I wasn't even riding, I was literally walking my bike. And it was an African cop. He was hiding behind a wall. I could see him up the block and he jumped out and told me that he was gonna give me a ticket for riding on the sidewalk. And I had this like, imagine me, I had an orange helmet on with like some workout biker tights. Like I argued with him, telling him that this was not right. He knew it wasn't right. So he began to call for backup. That's when I was surrounded by 10 cops in Brooklyn on Franklin Ave. They all surrounded me around my bike with my army helmet on and my biker attire. They were ready to arrest me until I told them that I needed to teach to the next day. And they said, well, what do you teach? I said, I teach art. So after they heard this, they gave me a ticket and a warning stating that this particular area is a popular drug selling area. How was I supposed to know that? It was during the day, the sun was out. I had no clue of knowing that. All I was doing was just getting some exercise, riding my bike. That cop was trying to make his quota and he needed to make a certain number of arrests at the end of the day. I even noticed there was like a tax write-off number on the ticket. And that, that case was immediately thrown out the window because it's just, it just made no sense. It was completely ludicrous. So I've been stopped by police in the park across from my, from my apartment because I had a hood on while I was talking on the phone at night. I even created art about the piece about this because it, 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 it hurt so much. I mean, they thought I was selling drugs. So like, <laughs> I literally had to tell them I was talking on the phone to my mother, checking in, but they didn't believe me. The other cop was ready to arrest me. Luckily, I got out of that situation again, and I told them I live right across the street. That is my house. This was during the time of Bloomberg stop and frisk. So um, the police were very aggressive. Like, they wanted to check me. Um, but I remember how angry the cops were at me because I told them what they were doing wasn't right. I was also stopped once at Port Authority by the police while going to the subway. So when you walk down the steps in Port Authority, there's a section where the police are sitting on the side. Uh, so while I was walking down the pathway, they, they can randomly choose whomever they want to search their bag. So black cop was staring at me while I was walking down the steps. So he 
came over to me aggressively and said, mm -hmm. I need to check your bag. I was totally confused. So to be safe, I just let him check it. And I, I just, I just, I just needed to be safe. I was even stopped by the police officer at SAR High School. The officer approached me, asked me what I was doing there. And I told him I teach here. And he then asked, what do I teach? So I got so upset because it was happening again. And uh, the hurt was very familiar. So I didn't in all cases like that. You just are supposed to just like submit and agree. But I was just so upset because, you know, I know I'm not a full time staff at SAR High School, but I'm there frequently. <laughs> and he still came after me in the sense of thinking that I wasn't a part of the student body. So the hurt wasn't it's so familiar. So I walked past the officer and I unlocked the door with my fingerprint and I was walked into the school while in the school i casually brought it up to mr wander and uh he reported it to dr schwartz who handled the situation and i didn't even think of reporting it sadly because like this treatment <laughs> has become so familiar to me um the only time i feel like i don't get bothered is when i have a suit on but it's great to know that Mr. Wander and Mr. Freeman are great allies because they listen to me and um, followed up against uh, her rest of my life. I can't speak for the billions of other Black people, but I can relate. I can relate to Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old African-American woman who was an emergency room technician who was killed in her own home by the police who granted a warrant to who were granted a warrant to enter her home without warning or identification. I can relate to Ahmaud Arbery, 25 year old black man who was shot to death because he was mistaken for a burglar while jogging in a neighborhood outside of Brunswick, Georgia. He was in gym attire just like me. I can relate to George Floyd. He was unarmed and defenseless on the ground. And the cops still continued to wrongfully press his knee into his neck. I can relate to Eric Gardner, who died while in the chokehold for being accused of selling cigarettes. And I can relate to Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager wrongfully killed. They are just a few of the many stories that must be heard because that could have been me or my son. And I'm already telling my son what my mother told me. He's also very tall for his age, even at the age of 10. He looks like he could be 13. And since he was seven, he always asked me, why could I not play with certain toys like squirt guns or Nerf guns outside with his other friends that don't have the same complexion as he does? He continued to ask me, why is it that the, uh, my other friends could? And the answer I told him was that I need you to survive, just like I have to su survive every day because I have to stay alive in order to provide for our family. I mean, can you imagine saying that to your child, your little brother or your sister? A seven-year-old kid is innocent to the world. It's not fair. But these experiences have only made me stronger. Please educate yourselves. Take the time to understand the perspective of people who don't look like you. Knowledge is power. Change starts within ourselves. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Atson, for sharing that with us. I want to say to the SAR community that when I first reached out to Mr. Atson and asked him if he would speak, he didn't want to. He didn't want to take on this role. He's an art teacher in our school community. This isn't the role he has in our school community. And then he called me back a few hours later. And he said to me, I didn't want to do it because it's so painful. But as an educator, he felt like he was ready and willing, even if he didn't want to, to step into this role of being willing to put his pain out there to educate us. And I think that we have to be willing, more than willing, we have to be open and invite hearing this, taking it in, hearing what experiences that are so compelling and so powerful and so different than what most of us are going to experience, hearing that and then thinking about what we have to do. And finding out that even in our own beloved SAR High School, where we feel so safe, 
somebody else might be made to feel not safe. And thinking about what that means and what we have to do, Mr. Atson, we're really so, so grateful to you for being willing to share your experiences with us. And now, as I introduced earlier, Ms. Rachel Sworns, journalist and journalism professor, is going to speak to us about the history and the background that brings us to this moment. Ms. Sworns. Hi, everyone. Um, and, um, it's, uh, I've got to talk a little, um, and that's what I do, and I will, but I'm, I'm so glad that you got to hear from your, our teacher, because this is, this is real, it's real for so many of us. Um, and, you know, these protests around the country have sparked um, a national conversation about race, right, about racial violence at the hands of the police, about racial disparities uh, when it comes to communities of color hit hardest by the pandemic. Um, and these are important conversations. Um, but today I was hoping to step back um, and I want to set the historical stage for these disparities and, and talk a little bit about the origins of our racial divide. I want to make sure though that you guys can still hear me. Um, so yeah, so today, as I was saying, I, I want to step back a bit. Um, I uh, set the historical stage uh, for these disparities and talk about the origins of our racial divide. Uh, specifically, um, I want to talk about legacies and how we live with those legacies even now. And I know that when I talk about this, many people start thinking, oh no, not again. Slay, that was more than a hundred years ago. None of ancestors owned slaves. Besides, I know already. And, um, and I get it, I, I do get it. You know, I'm a college educated journalist with a master's degree. I've been working at the New York Times for more than two decades. I'm a professor now, as you know, at NYU. And I thought I knew about slavery too. Uh, but the truth is that I, and that most of us don't. And so, Let me just interrupt for a second. It's clear uh, that uh, Ms. Swarn's uh, internet connection is a little bit shaky. We've had this experience before in a CARES uh, episode. I believe it was even last week. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to open to, you know, I, I think that some people have been sending Dr. Schwartz some questions um, when Mr. Atson was speaking. Dr. Schwartz, uh, perhaps, you know, we can moderate that for just a bit. And we're gonna, what we're going to try to do is to... Uh, get Rachel Swarns on to uh, perhaps to be able to call in rather than to use her internet. Dr. Schwartz. And I wanna say specifically, since right now we're having difficulty with Ms. Swarns' connection, um, if you have questions for Mr. Atson and about Mr. Atson's experiences, please feel free to send those in right now. Um, one question that we got in so far is actually a historical question, more than a specific question about Mr. Atson's experiences, which is a question about racism against, against people of African descent, against black people in the United States, uh, as compared to in the rest of the world. Uh, and the answer, of course, there is that it's tricky. It's the same in certain ways, and it's different in other ways. Um, the, the United States is particularly and distinctively marked by its history of having had slavery, of having, ch having had chattel slavery in the United States. And that uh, leaves a, a different outcome and a different impact in the United States and its history. That's not to say that there isn't racism against people of African descent in other countries, um, but that it plays out differently and particularly in the United States because of the United States' history uh, when it comes to a country that was founded with chattel slavery, and a country which has been dealing with the impact of that ever since. Some of you might have seen in the protests over the past few days that in addition to everything else that's been going on, uh, statues of uh, Confederate generals or con the Confederate President Jefferson Davis have been, um, have been taken down. And you might wonder what on earth the Confederacy has to do with the moment they're in. 
But in American history, it's everything because that history of slavery and the war about whether the United States would continue to have slaves or not have slaves is very much uh, imprinted on the legacy of racial justice and injustice in the United States today. And that's why some of these protesters are, uh, are taking down uh, Confederate statues. So the question about race in the United States and the rest of the world, again, there are similarities and differences, but America's particular history with chattel slavery uh, makes this uh, play out a particular way in the United States. Uh, one of our teachers, Mr. Atson, asks if you've ever experienced insensitive language about around race in our school from students or faculty, because if this is a moment for us to do a little bit of soul searching and to see where we can do better and where we have to be uh, first more aware, more sensitive, and then to make change, I think that's an important question for us to ask and answer. Never, never experienced that. Um... I think um, one of the things I love about teaching is that the students don't see you, they see your soul. Once they get to know you, they see who your soul is. So it's like, those type of things don't come up ever. <laughs> it's always about the lesson. And then we relate to each other through what we love, art, animation, things in pop culture. That's, uh, that's, I have to say that I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, at least that. Uh, another student asked if at any time you ever reported to the police or about the police any of these interactions that you had, any of these painful, humiliating interactions that you had. No, no, I never. Interesting question. Uh, I, 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 I don't really ha like have a good relationship where I don't think of the experience. certain extent, like if there's something, you know, the house is burning down, we got to call, <laughs> call them. But when it comes to incidents that have happened, no, I don't, I, I, I didn't. And at one point I think, I was just so shocked sometimes I don't think about reading them, but, and I was a lot younger. So when I got pulled over in Brooklyn, uh, I was with another friend of mine. So I was a lot younger. And I think now that I'm older, I definitely would. I definitely would, without a doubt. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't. We have a lot more questions coming in, but I'm told now that Ms. Swarns is back on the line and is able to continue. So we're gonna go back to her. And if we have time at the end, uh, we will continue to take more questions. Otherwise, all of you know how to find Mr. Adson and uh, can engage with him around <laughs> this on your own. Yeah. Rabbi Bloom, we have Ms. Lawrence back on. I thought that we did, but it seems like we might not. So we're gonna to try to just get her on the phone. Okay, I'm gonna go back now then to some of the questions that we have. Um, one student asked if you could talk about, you had mentioned that at least one of the times you were stopped, that you were stopped by a black officer. And if you could talk about the intersections between race and policing and how that plays out, um, how you understand that given that it wasn't only uh, officers of different race who had stopped you? Yeah, I think, I definitely think that um, when it comes to police, from my experience, it's across the board. Uh, black cops don't. So when these things are happening, I don't think they really, the, because they know that they're coming at they're coming at me. I can't relate to them because they are they're in a, a police force. And in that force, they have a different vision of what needs to be done. Sometimes their criteria might be we need to find somebody that looks in this description because I have to meet a quota, you know? And in that sense, being singled out in that way is hurtful to me because I'm just trying to live my life. I, I have no need to be a part of any type of wrongful doing whatsoever. I'm, I have responsibilities to take care of. But in that sense, 
I cannot talk to someone who is a cop that is black uh, and say, hey, look, this is wrong without them being like, you know what, this is wrong because they already had another agenda in place for themselves. Whether it's a tax write-off for, uh, you know, giving me a tick, me, me because of something. So, you know, it, 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 but in my mind as well too, because I don't really walk around thinking that people are wrongfully trying to do things to me on purpose. Like, even if it's a cop, like I'm not thinking that way, but for some reason, it's been the same agenda. I've had more interaction with black cops who are ready to throw me in prison or put me in the back of their van more than the white cops. We're getting a lot of questions in. Um, we're gonna continue with some of them, but I, I actually wanna address a question that one student addressed to me. And she said to me, did you know that Mr. Atson had these specific experiences when you asked him to speak? Or is this so widespread that you just felt like if you asked any African-American person, certainly any African-American man, that they would most likely have had one or in Mr. Atson's case, many of these experiences? And unfortunately, the answer is, I didn't know that Mr. Atson had had any of these experiences, but I know enough to know that this reality is so widespread um, that it was a pretty good bet. And that, that if we asked him, it was a pretty good bet that he would have uh, stories to share. Another student asked if you've had any experience with racism in the arts, trying to work in the arts and make a career in the arts. Have you ever encountered racism or racial discrimination um, in that regard? Uh, of course. I think every, every black actor has. <laughs> every black actor has. Where um, I would be playing... Wait, Mr. Atson, I think we should stop right there. I don't know that all SR high school students know that you're an actor. They know that you're an art teacher. I don't know if they know that in addition to being an art teacher, you're an actor. So maybe let's stop oh. and tell them that and okay. then move on from there. Okay, SAR high school, in addition to being an art teacher, Mr. Atson is an actor. <laughs> yes, I am. I know. We have it recorded now, too. So you can't... So if I start trying to hide from being that aspect, you could just say, hey... Mr. Atson, we have you recorded saying you're an actor. Yes, I am an actor as well, too. And I have um, had roles where I had to play a character that I totally was not. But that is a part of acting. And um, those type of roles don't bother me because I've learned how to humanize uh, the character so that for myself, there is something underneath what is often... Um, portrayed as like with um Lawrence Fishburne in um Platoon his character uh many other black actors who have play, had to play had had to get their start by playing um uh thugs or or these characters that are seen as villains have humanized them to a point where the audience can see them more than what is written on in the script so these are actions that I have to take if I do assume that role but that's art, you know, that's art to me, yeah. Hi, and I wanted to say that I'm here by audio. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with my video. I apologize. Okay, wonderful. We have Ms. Swarns back. So if you can, you, you were talking about uh, the extent to which, although we might think we knew the history of slavery or even that you felt like you knew the history of slavery, um, that as you, as you really started to research it journalistically um, and historically, that you found there was really much more um, than you had known. So I think that's where we were. Uh... Right, that's right. Um, can you hear me still? Yes, yes. Okay, great, <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, and so, um, you know, I, uh, this was stuff that I didn't know either. And so I often get the kind of like, oh no, you know, it's slavery again. And, and I, I want to tell you that, um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey and what I've learned as, you know, I've ended up uh, entirely unexpectedly um, doing this kind of deep dive um, into our nation's history. And, and my hope really is that this will give you some context for the struggles we're going through now as a nation and um, the good news is that this won't be too painful, I promise, because it starts with Michelle Obama and she has a great story. So I promise it will be, um, that, that always helps. 
Um, and, and really, um, for me, it starts with um, a decision that the New York Times made um, to do something unusual um, in 2018. Um, as you've heard, I've been a correspondent for the New York Times for a long time, um, contributing writer now. Um, but, you know, I did all the kinds of things that a correspondent would do. You know, I worked overseas in places like Russia and Cuba, Guatemala, Northern Ireland, and served as um, the Johannesburg Bureau Chief. I worked in Washington um, covering um, legislation on the Hill, covering presidential uh, campaigns, spending a lot of time in Iowa. Um, and, um, but in, in 2008, um, the editors at the New York Times and at a lot of papers actually decided to do something different. Um, they asked me to spend the following year um, covering Michelle Obama and the first family. Um, and this is something unusual because usually um, first families are covered by um, White House correspondents, you know, who chase the president around the briefing room and on Air Force One um, and, and the first family when they can, uh, when they have time, which is not so often. Um, but there was a sense um, in that year that we should do something different. Um, there was a sense that this family, this first African-American family um, living in this White House, built in part um, with slave labor, was going to be written about for generations to come. And, and we wanted to be a part of doing that. We often think of ourselves as journalists as writing the first draft of history. And... Um, and the seeds of this journey into American history for me started there. Um, a colleague of mine was writing about the president and his rainbow family and thought, huh, what do we know about Mrs. Obama? Not so much. We asked a genealogist to dig. We didn't give her much time. She didn't find too much for the story that ran about the president and his rainbow family. But in September of that uh, first year that the Obamas were in the White House, she called us back and she said, listen, I've come up with some really interesting stuff. Would you be interested in writing about it? And we were interested, very interested. I got on a plane, flew out to Birmingham, Alabama, um, and where I um, searched for anyone who knew anything about a man by the name of Dolphus Shields, who was the First Lady's great, great grandfather. Um, and he happened to be biracial. Um, and the story ended up being about his parents, the first lady's great, great, great grandmother, who was an enslaved girl named Melvinia, and her great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. Um, the story ran on the front page of the New York Times. It was news to the first lady and her family. And, and a book publisher um, ended up giving me a ring and saying, hey, do you want to do more? And so I spent about a year and a half traveling around the country, trying to find out what I could um, about her enslaved ancestors. Um, and what I realized as I poured over 19th century records, traveled to Virginia, South Carolina, Alabama, all over the place, um, was that her story reflected not only her family story, obviously, um, but the story of America, and particularly the story of American slavery. And some of that story was very different um, from what I had learned um, in school and what we often learn. Um, when I thought about slavery anyway, maybe many of you, I thought about kind of gone with the wind slavery, right? Um, the grand manor, the rolling long, you know, the vast estate, hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people. Um, but in Clayton County, Georgia, where Mrs. Obama's great, great, great grandmother uh, was enslaved, it wasn't like that at all. Um, she grew up on a farm where she was one of only three enslaved people in a place where white people worked alongside their enslaved people. Um, this was a landscape of American slavery that I was really unfamiliar with. And it showed me that um, the economic benefits of slavery extended far beyond just the wealthiest white plantation owners to much more ordinary families who managed to buy one or two people um, or to rent enslaved people from larger plantations. And it showed me that the benefits of slave labor extended much more broadly than I had imagined. I managed to track down um, the descendants of the family that owned Melvinia. And then um, I used DNA testing uh, 
to identify the white ancestors in Mrs. Obama's family tree, using 21st century technology to solve that 19th century mystery in her family. And it turns out that Mrs. Obama has a whole constellation of white distant cousins scattered across the South. And guess what? You know, they didn't know this history either. And you can imagine what it might be like uh, if a New York Times reporter were to call you and say, by the way, um, your ancestors owned members of the First Lady's family. That's quite something. Or worse still, um, that your ancestors may have, um, you know, brutalized a member of the First Lady's family. Um, you know, these were very difficult conversations. Um, and to my point that I brought up in the beginning, um, many of these families were stunned because they had no idea um, that their ancestors or that small white farmers owned or rented people and benefited um, from that kind of labor. Um, that book came out in October, um, in, I'm sorry, in 2012. And four years later, um, I got started on what I'm working on now. Um, the CEO of a tech company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, reached out to a colleague of mine in the business sections of the paper, pitching a story about slaves and Georgetown and wanting to give us an exclusive. And, you know, my colleague was like, a story about slaves sold in 1838, was that even a story? Um, so it's my great fortune that she didn't delete the email. She remembered the work that I had done. And this showed me even more. So my book about Mrs. Obama's family examined how so many families, black, white, in between, uh, were shaped by um, and have their origins in this painful period, right, of American slavery. Um, but the story about Georgetown showed me something else that I didn't know. It showed me how slavery fueled the economy and the growth of some of our most prominent um, contemporary institutions. And the CEO told me something I didn't know. Again, something I, I thought I knew a lot, but I didn't know, which was that the Catholic priests who founded Georgetown were also slaveholders, among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. And in 1838, when it looked like Georgetown might uh, face bankruptcy, they decided to sell off their um, assets. Um, 272 men, women, and children to raise money to help save the school. Um, the strategy worked. Georgetown survived. It's, as you know, one of our, uh, the nation's elite universities, but it came at a terrible cost um, to um, these uh, families who were torn um, from their relatives and from their communities. And it's not just Georgetown, you know, Harvard, Princeton, UVA, um, there are dozens of universities that um, are now wrestling with um, the information that they have um, grown and flourished, um, uh, rooted in slave labor. And it's not just universities. The Catholic Church, uh, which founded and ran Georgetown, relied extensively on um, plantations and slave labor to grow and to thrive. And um, that's not the story that we usually tell or hear about um, the Catholic Church. Um, we often think about the Catholic Church as a northern church, an immigrant church. Um, but the truth is that, you know, enslaved people were largely left out of that story, but were critical to that story. And I happen to be Catholic and Black and had no idea. Um, and it's not um, just the Catholic Church. Many Protestant churches share this history. And last year, the leadership of a historic synagogue in Charleston acknowledged that Charleston's um, early Jewish community owned slaves too. Um, and they planned to honor the enslaved folks who are believed to have built um, their temple um, this year. And it's not just universities and religious organizations. Slavery generated businesses for um, some of our biggest corporations, insurance companies like New York Life and Aetna, banks like J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. All of them grew out of that history. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know. You probably didn't know. Um, does it matter? I think it matters. Whether um, I wrestle sometimes with the whys we don't know, but whether it was intentional or unintentional, this kind of disconnect, 
prevents us from understanding really how foundational slavery was to the growth of our in institutions and to so many of our families. Um, and it also spawned generations of discrimination and racial inequity, which we all live with today. And um, bringing us back a little closer to where we are now, um, a number of historians point out that discriminatory policing, you know, has its roots too in slavery and its aftermath. They point to the slave patrols, you know, that prevented people from, from fleeing um, these farms and plantations, as well as the, the vagrancy laws that emerged after slavery ended as a way to ensure that um, uh, white landowners could still maintain control of a black labor force. Um, some of you may know that the 13th Amendment, um, which uh, is obviously important in the history of um, enslaved people, free enslaved people, right, um, had a loophole. Uh, and if you haven't seen Ava DuVernay's 13th, it might be worth watching. But the loophole that many of us don't learn about in school, I certainly didn't, was that involuntary servitude was completely legal um, in conjunction with criminal convictions. Um, so at, at this point, people are often thinking, okay, wow, you know, I didn't know that. That's kind of interesting, um, but it still doesn't have anything to do with me. My ancestors came here long after slavery ended, um, and that's certainly true. Um, and, but it's really important to understand that um, many immigrants who arrived here long after slavery ended benefited from the system that emerged um, in slavery's wake. And it was a system that really reserved its resources and opportunities um, for, for white folks, right? Most of us are familiar with the system of oppression that emerged after slavery ended segregation and um, Jim Crow, which barred black people from education, healthcare, housing jobs, et cetera. And, and many Jewish families obviously bore the brunt of discrimination too, right? Because there were those kinds of um, bars up as well. Um, but a lot of people are less familiar with the efforts that the, the government made that were designed specifically to assist white families. Um, so not only just excluding blacks, but um, you know, assisting in a clear way financially white families. Um, and um, I don't, I, I always recommend to people, there's a wonderful podcast called Seeing White. Um, and um, and this, some of the things they point out are like social security, things we take for granted. The New Deal um, helps everyone now, but when it was first created, um, it excluded domestic and agricultural workers um, who were obviously disproportionately people of color. Um, and um, really the, the huge thing, because for most Americans, wealth is passed on through real estate, um, is, is what happened with the Federal Housing Authority and, and low interest loans that were provided um, to uh, millions of uh, working Americans. And you guys know uh, probably a little bit about redlining, um, but um, African Americans were largely cut out of that. Um, the low-income loans that allowed a whole generation of uh, families to uh, gain access to home ownership um, uh, was denied um, folks. And um, I'm going to wrap up because I know that um, because of my technical problems, um, I'm, I'm probably um, keeping you guys a little longer. Um, but, you know, these things um, have real impact. And, and live with us today. You've heard how it does um, in the stories that your art teacher shared so powerfully with you. Um, and um, in terms of, you know, fundamental things like, you know, the enormous wealth gap that exists um, in the United States today, um, that's really important. Um, and, and the lived experiences. Um, he was talking about kind of how African Americans, um, you know, even those of us who are professionals, um, you know, excellent in our craft, um, have to live today. And when he talked about wearing a suit, that really resonated with me, because often I think black people we think of clothes as our armor, because otherwise um, people make assumptions 
Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, people sometimes say, oh, those guys, you know, they got in trouble because they were, um, you know, arrested or criminals or something like that. Um, our former attorney general, Eric Holder, um, was stopped and questioned by the police. He tells this story um, when he was running to watch a, a, a movie, even though he happened to be a federal prosecutor at the time. Um, Senator Cory Booker, um, as a young man, was stopped and detained by police officers with guns drawn. And at the time, he was a newly selected Rhodes Scholar who had graduated from Stanford University. One of my neighbors um, who lives down the block, I live in New Jersey, um, she was going on vacation and has a nice pool. And she said, oh, you guys, you know, come, you know, while we're away, feel free to use the pool. I came home to my husband and said, hey, we're going to wouldn't that be awesome? He said, what are you thinking? Like, we, we cannot, like, as a Black family, go into our neighbor's, you know, someone's pool, uh, backyard, when they are not home. Like, what are you thinking about? And it's, it's one of those things that, um, uh, you know, again, we live with. And I think it's most painful when you think about your kids. I've got two boys. And, um, you know, my younger son is um, a high honor roll, uh, you know, uh, an amazing athlete. Um, and I have to tell him about, you know, and, and, and a real smart aleck, okay? And I got a seventh grade. I've got to tell him about how to live in this world, about how to watch um, what he wears, how to watch how he talks. Um, if he's ever stopped by police and some of his white friends start talking back, he can never do that. Never, even if the police are wrong. Um, so anyway, I, I will wrap up. I, I, but I think um, the history is really important to understand kind of how we got to where we are. Um, and it's really important to, to dive into it because we don't really know many of us, and I include myself in that. Um, how much it has shaped um, both families and the institutions that are around us today. Thank you so much. I want to thank Ms. Swarns for joining us, for giving us both, as it turns out, that historical perspective and also that personal perspective. I really want to thank Mr. Atson for sharing his personal perspective and taking so many of your questions. Some of you have said in the chat, you know, what are action items? What are steps? What are things that we can do? We have a group of students in the school who've been working on this and pulling together a set of resources. And Mr. Atson has sent us a lot of resources. We'll be pulling something together and sending to you in the next day or so with specific action items for students who want to know what things they can do. But that might be for you know, a smaller subgroup of students in the school. But I think for all of us, even those of us who may not be figuring out what the next steps that there are in terms of taking further action, but for all of us to start to learn that history, as Ms. Swarn said, to understand how it continues to shape and affect the world we live in, to know that experiences like Mr. Atson's, like Ms. Swarn's, like their sons, are the experiences that many Americans are living with, even if, again, for most of us in the High School community, those aren't the experiences we're living with this, and then to let that inform right now how we listen and learn and think about and understand the issues that are being raised and the conversations that are being had. I think that's an important thing for all of us as part of this school community to do. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's program.